I watched uh, an interesting experiment the other day. Researchers mounted a Velcro target on the wall in a room and drew a line seven feet away and recruited a group of ten five- to seven-year-old children. And they instructed the kids to throw darts at the target from uh, behind the line. Each child got three attempts. And, um, but what the researchers did is they divided the group into two groups and they told the first group of kids that an invisible adult was in the room refereeing in the attempts. They told the other group no one was watching. And uh, the adults, the, research, the researchers who were adults observed that the children in the first group played by the rules because they were under the impression they were told that there was an adult watching them. And the other group cheated. Besides the questionable ethics of a study that deceives its participants in the name of science, this experiment concluded what the Bible has affirmed for millennia. And that is that deception is a part of human nature since Adam fell into sin, according to Genesis 3. And the other finding points out that people are more likely to cheat when they think people are watching and uh, in other words, when you remove the all-knowing God from your worldview, um, you will s start to believe that deception is not only acceptable, but then you move that to being justifiable and ultimately necessary. That's the worldview that eliminates God, and it includes that uh, lying and deception is necessary. And I wonder if the researchers consider the irony of an experiment that deceives children to evaluate how deceptive these children can be. In their viewpoint, lying to them was necessary. So such a substandard ethical system operates almost subconsciously in our minds. We created terms for these things. For example, half-truths or white lies. And we use deception subconsciously sometimes when we think that we will receive some sort of benefit or self-promotion or to get out of trouble. And that is the reason why we demand everything in writing. Thinking of, think about this. If none of us were sinners, then contracts would be obsolete. But uh, that's the, the reason for that. We're not surprised. The Bible says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And that's in 1 John 5, 9. And God does not see deception as casually as we do. In other words, His standard of ethics is much higher than ours. Case in point, Proverbs 12, verse 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. And this is His verdict on deception, according to Revelation 21, verse 8. That text says, Liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And that verse, my friends, indicts me, and it should indict you too, because we are liars by nature. If you ever told one lie, that makes you um, a liar, and along with every person in the world. But that verse reminds me, if it weren't for my Savior dying on a cross to redeem me, my final destination would have been the lake of fire. So thank God for His grace. Now, Christ has something to, do, something to say about deception. In fact, it's the theme of the third heading of the Sermon on the Mount here in, Genesis, in Matthew 5. And by the time Jesus addresses this issue here, He has already established a pattern. And the pattern is this. He is confronting false religion. He is confronting the hypocritical system of the scribes and Pharisees who took Old Testament truth, modify that truth to suit their fancies and uh, to create a substandard of ethics, a substandard of religion, one that focuses on the outside. And Jesus is confronting that head on, tearing the facade and telling them, your system is corrupt. In fact, again, Matthew 5 verse 20 is our key verse for the entire Sermon on the Mount. Let me remind you once again that Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is tearing down that system and clarifying to people the real deal, the real righteousness that is by faith and, um, and the ethics of that system. So, and that system uh, guides or should guide our actions because it flows from a transformed heart. You see the scribes and Pharisees uh, 
picking up from tradition from centuries before, perpetuated that corrupt system that failed to address the heart. And Jesus says, no, 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 true religion, true righteousness comes from a transformed heart. And that transformed heart guides your words and actions. And, and this is how you need to live by that standard of righteousness that is by grace through faith. So he presents the precepts of the kingdom because he is the majestic Savior. You know, you remember this. Matthew is presenting Jesus Christ as the King of Kings, the King of the Jews, who is the King of Kings. And therefore now, chapters 5 through 7 of his gospel, uh, he gives us the precepts of that King, the majestic Savior. The first portion of this course in the book of Matthew. And here it is. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. Let's talk about how to handle deception according to Christ. And he says this, Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make uh, false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. And therefore, this is how he teaches us how to handle the issue of deception, which comes from the heart. Remember, all of these things come from an unregenerate heart. And Jesus Christ is addressing how we are supposed to deal with this. Subjects of the kingdom of heaven, born again, believers in Christ. And in order to make his case here, he gives us a three-point outline, very simple. And we're going to honor that outline because, again, this is not my sermon. This is the Sermon of the, on the Mount that Jesus gave. And the three-point outline is very uh, clear here. He gives us the pattern, the problem, and the principle. So we will start with the pattern here in verse 33. Concerning the issue of how to handle deception, here's the pattern that Jesus presents. And uh, we know that there's a pattern because he starts this entire paragraph with the word again. And by doing this, he calls the attention of his audience to the common theme of the Sermon on the Mount so far. Once again, God's ethical standards which are significantly higher than men's because it addresses the heart. Remember, men will put the standard way down here so that something we can meet in order to say, Ha! I earned my way to heaven. And Jesus is saying, No, you cannot earn your way to heaven because my standard is a lot higher than yours. And it addresses the heart. And he contrasts then Pharisaical corruption of Scripture with the pure teaching of the Word of God that he provides. So he's not contrasting Old Testament truth with what he's saying. He is putting the Old Testament where it belongs. And we know that this is truth because of his formula. He says, you heard this, instead of saying it is written. When he wanted to quote Old Testament in Matthew 4, in fact, he quoted to the devil three times from the, book, from the Old Testament. He says, it is written. But here he says this formula in this chapter. You heard this, but I say that. And by the way, that's the reason the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Matthew tells us in chapter 7, verse 29, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. What he means by that is Jesus is not quoting any, any theologian. He doesn't have to do that because he is the one who fulfills the Old Testament. The Old Testament is all about him. And therefore, he doesn't need to quote anybody. He says, you have heard this, which is the false teaching, but I say this, which is the correct teaching. And he mentions the ancients one more time here in the short uh, the, the paragraph. And these guys, let me point out to you, are not Old Testament writers. We've been saying this um, for, since we've been covering these issues here because it's very clear from the context. He, uh, the, the ancients were the rabbis of old who corrupted the Mosaic law into man-made systems of religion. And the scribes and Pharisees perpetuated this hypocritical tradition. And Jesus now presents or exposes here a, a common misinterpretation of uh, Leviticus 19 verse 12 and also Numbers 30 verse 2. Let me read them to you. Leviticus 19 verse 12 reads this. You shall not swear falsely by my name. So as to profane the name of God. I am the Lord. 
And in Numbers 30 verse 2 says this, If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with the binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds. Now, the problem that Jesus is addressing here is that the ancient rabbis misapplied these verses in order to uh, suit their fancies, like I said before. And they came up with a list of enforceable and non-enforceable oaths based on uh, whether or not they wanted to keep their promise. And they would invoke testimonies of their oaths. So, in other words, the truthfulness of one's word would vary according to the rank of the witness that they would invoke. For example, heaven earth or Jerusalem or oneself. So they could swear by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem, depending on how they intended to keep their promises. And they created a false hierarchy in their vows and oaths and say, well, if I swear by heaven, then I really mean it. If I swear by the earth, I sort of mean it and so forth. Now, the scribes and Pharisees during Jesus' time caught up to that and taught others that the only binding vows that counted were the ones that invoked the name of God. And it didn't occur to them that by associating God's name with such a deceptive practice, they violated the third commandment of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which reads this, Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. So by invoking God's name on the condition that that is the only word that I'm going to keep, they were violating the third commandment. And Jesus is clear about that. So according to this pharisaical philosophy, any lesser witness to an oath, anyone less than God would somehow grant people a pass on speaking the truth. The name for that church is premeditated deception. And by doing this, they defrauded people and they dishonored God because of their hypocritical system. Once again, Jesus reminds everyone, unless your righteousness surpasses that substandard ethical system, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because the kingdom of heaven could be obtained by speaking the truth, but by coming to Christ and having a transformed heart. And then the natural consequence of that is you will have a transformed attitude because the heart has been changed. Now, let me point out to you again that that's not by coincidence that he brings up this issue right after the problem of divorce that he addresses in Matthew 5, verse 32. And he's saying to everybody, well, you are not keeping your vows. Just by signing a paper, the certificate of divorce, you are breaking your vows. You are therefore dishonoring God. You are taking God's name in vain because most likely you have invoked it. You invoked the name of God uh, as a witness. So, that's the issue that Jesus is uh, addressing. That's the pattern. And although uh, we live in different times, a modern equivalent of a uh, frivolous vow, for example, would be the expression, I swear by my mother's grave. We, we, we've heard this, or I've, I've heard this a couple of times, or some, some of you may hear it more often, but it provides a modern example of uh, a similarly frivolous vow because such a device is an emotional appeal. Uh, to somehow boost the credibility as if by invoking the witness of a dead person. Uh, that would make your promise serious. No, let's think about the silliness of that. First of all, a dead person cannot serve as a witness against you if you don't speak the truth. Because um, dead people don't see anything. They, 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 they can't see what's going on here down here in earth. And even if your mother is in heaven... Your mother wouldn't uh, testify against you because moms are irrationally biased against their, uh, for their children. Just like the mom who testifies in court about the serial killer son and says, no, he's not a bad person. He's just a victim of circumstances, a victim of a bad upbringing or the victim of, uh, of, of the society. So your mother's not omniscient, although you better obey your mom because she knows better. But the point is, that is, a, that is a silly way to appeal to emotion, to sort of boost your credibility, to say, now, I really mean it. I'm swearing by my mother's grave. Don't do that. This is what Jesus is saying, because that is silly. Only God sees what's in your heart. And re let me remind you of 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The Lord looks at the heart. So before you even utter a word, God knows whether you mean it or not. God knows the evil intent of your heart or the pure intents of your heart. So there's no need for you to say something like this. Uh, even if you change this, this uh, vow to say, no, okay, well, let me swear on my mother's life, then 
though no, that still doesn't count, you might as well cross your fingers. Because, um, again, your mother is not omnipresent. She doesn't know the real intention of your heart or anyone else by that matter. So uh, this doesn't mean anything. You might as well, again, cross your fingers. Now consider the relevance of the Word of God again. Just like the scribes and Pharisees, we are tempted to only fulfill our promises conditionally. When, uh, as long as doing so advocates our agenda, for example, or improves the self-image or the image we want to portray, politicians are very skilled at that. So in verse 33 here, to summarize the entire thing here, what Jesus is doing, he's exposing hypocritical religion. He's exposing uh, a system that allows deception based on meaningless vowels, the formalities that actually don't mean anything, the solemnity, the false solemnity with their words, outward focus spirituality, worldliness dressed up in the cloak of godliness because the people who were invoking these frivolous vows were already uh, bent on not fulfilling their vows according to however they word their, their, their vows. Case in point, the marriage violation, the issue that Jesus just talked about and we covered last week. So Jesus identifies the pattern and exposes their, their evil heart concerning deception but look at the problem verses 34 through 36 after confronting more of these uh, rabbinical teachings here he pinpoint the pinpoints the real issue and he's saying this you make promises you don't intend to keep and you use frivolous silly oaths to give the impression of formality to give us a, a false sense of solemnity and according to that hypocritical system people would break their promises they were allowed to break their promises uh, and say this. Now, I'm off the hook because I didn't swear by God on this one. I only swore by Jerusalem, so I'm okay. Or they would say, well, the reason I told you I have truth is because I only swore by the earth. You see, you didn't catch me. If I would have sworn by heaven, then I would have meant it. Or they would say, well, I swore on myself on this one. Now, can you think, church, of anything more treacherous than this? This kind of thinking should never cross the mind of a Christian. should never cross the mind of a subject of the kingdom of heaven. Now, and you would say, Pastor, I would never do something so silly. Well, that may be true because of the difference in culture, but here's how that convoluted rationale creeps into our reality today. We only think our word is good if we put it in writing. We only think that our word is good if we write it on a contract. And for this reason, somebody, many people think that uh, verbal commitments somehow are less important or less binding than your written word. And the truth is, church, if you're a follower of Christ, if you are a subject of the kingdom of heaven, your word is your bond. Okay, it, it, Whether you put it in writing or not, whether you say the formalities or not, you me must mean what you say and you must vow to commit the truth without sounding the trumpet of a solemn, solemn oath. You just vow in your heart to speak the truth, whether you put it in writing or not. An example of that, and, and this is a funny one, okay? You husbands will identify with me on this one. You tell your wife you're going to fix the, the kitchen sink... You do it. Pastor, I told her 10 months ago I was going to do it. I didn't purposely didn't give her the time limit because I don't want to assume that I don't know how to do it. I mean, I'm guilty. Now, if you do that, just get somebody else to do it. <laughs> but fulfill your vow. Okay? Do what you said you would. But in a less humorous example, an age of quick divorce. To keep with the context here of the immediate uh, issues, that, the, the related issues that Jesus is dealing with. Husband and wife-to-be say all the formalities and make promises to stay together in the presence of people, in the presence of a minister usually, and in the presence of the state. They sign a paper and they invoke God, most likely, and they say this, we will stay together until death separates us. And what they really mean is this, we will stay together until convenience separates us. Or as long as the butterflies in my stomach are still flying. Or until you provide the lifestyle that I desire. Or until I find someone else who's better looking or makes me happier. Once again, church, that is called premeditated deception. And that's the reason we normally recommend here at Grace Baptist Church, don't rush to get married. 
Only tie the knot if you are ready to keep your promise to your potential spouse at all costs, no matter what happens. Furthermore, uh, we don't want to make any commitments we don't, want, we don't intend to keep. Now, we need to explain what, what uh, we mean by this because this doesn't mean that you are forever bound to serve in a local church in a particular ministry uh, when you sign up. Everybody understands the need to change, the need to refocus, the need to rethink and take a break. Uh, and each, what, what, what we mean by that, by fulfilling your vows, the fulfilling your verbal commitment is this. You, you, you are there by the time you said you would be there. And because there are people counting on you. A verbal commitment means that. You show up when you said you would. Unless something happens, in which case you notify the people who need to know. Everybody understands emergency. Everybody understands the need to, to, to rechannel your energy and to focus on something else. That's not, you're not in violation of a principle here if you need to do that. Same is true if, uh, if you are in a job and you need to change careers for one reason or another. It doesn't mean you're wrong if you do it right. If, if you tell you, you fulfill your contract, you fulfill your duties, and then you say to your boss, listen, uh, I've been thinking and it's time for me to change. And, of course, you're free to do that. There's, um, that's not what Scripture means by that. If you do it the right way. And speaking of a job situation, years ago I read the story. This is a true story. I read the story of a young man who was hired uh, by the sales department of a company, and his boss promised him a bunch of things. Uh, in their contract, a one-year contract, including a bonus if the yearly quota was met, which the young man, the employee, actually exceeded. So the boss called him to his office one day and told him this, I know I promised you this amount last year, and you excelled at your, in your position, but I'm sorry to say the company can't pay you your bonus. And you may have experienced a situation like that before. This is very common. This is not uncommon today. But before the employee could say anything in protest, that manager continued. And he said, but listen, I made you a promise. And he handed that employee a personal check for the amount of the bonus that he had promised. That is a man of integrity. That is a boss we need to imitate. And that is a boss we need to work for. Because that is a man who understands the power of his word. He understands this principle here that Jesus is talking about. You don't have to make a promise. But when you do, you follow that promise. And you fulfill your commitment. Because your word is your bond. It shouldn't even cross our minds. If we're believers in Christ, subjects of the kingdom of heaven. shouldn't even cross our minds to modify that. And by the way, God's going to hold everybody by this standard. It doesn't mean that Christians should live by this standard and non-Christians get a pass on that. No, they're going to be judged by that. The, the difference is that believers in Christ, God will say, I remember no more of your sins because you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and therefore he saved you, my son Jesus Christ saved you by his grace. So this man here, this boss that I'm talking to you about, is an extremely rare boss. And um, people, we should imitate this. And uh, he's someone that David might as well have been describing when he talks uh, like this in Psalm 15, verse 4. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. Meaning, the guy keeps his promise even if it's costly. Even if it hurts. And he tells the truth at all costs. Even if it makes him embarrassed. Even if it's incriminating. Even if that's going to... Uh, cause us other inconveniences namely to write a check for the amount for personal check to fulfill your promise now i remember telling this principle to an unmarried couple one time who wanted to get married so this is no one from grace baptist church so this is you don't know this couple here but they were living together the proverbial shacking up they lived together before they got married and they wanted to join the church first of all and uh, they wanted to uh, the, 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 they, didn't want, they weren't looking to get married. They wanted to join the church. And um, since both of them professed to be believers, I confronted them with, uh, with the fact that they were in violation of biblical principles and what the, what we, need, we needed to address that issue first. Before they became members of the church, they needed to get married. They were both believers in Christ. Um, and, but the, I remember the lady told me they couldn't get married because if they did, she would lose her widow benefits from the U.S. military. And to my shock and surprise, the boyfriend didn't seem to mind that at all. He didn't mind receiving that check every, 
every month. So they were living together, unmarried, but they were not. Uh, they, speaking the truth would bring an inconvenience to them. And I told them, and we went through Scripture, and I told them, you know what? Obedience is costly. Telling the truth is costly. It may bring a temporary inconvenience, but you will honor God in the long run, and God, therefore, will honor you back. Well, needless to say, and I offered to shepherd them through the process, but you wanted, they wanted nothing to do with that. I never saw them after this. It's a sad story. That reminds me of Joseph's brothers, for example, in the Bible. Their story starts in Genesis uh, 37, 36, 37 there. And they concluded that speaking the truth concerning their betrayal to Joseph, uh, to their father, was too high a price to pay. And as a result, they decided to invent a story about the death of Joseph. And that story brought excessive sorrow to Jacob and Rachel. You, you may remember the story. But the good news is that God redeemed that whole situation and brought forgiveness and reconciliation decades later. So, uh, and that is to illustrate the point that Jesus, uh, according to Jesus, the, the standard that he requires for subjects of the kingdom of heaven is, is high because it matches the integrity and the ethics of our Savior. And it says, you need to live by that standard. And by the way, you can't attain to that standard on your own. You need a Savior to equip you for that. But what you're not to do, as he's saying, is follow the scribes and Pharisees, the religion that is based on outward performance, that leaves the heart untouched. And one specific example of that is those uh, premeditated deception, those meaningless and fri frivolous vows that people would use to impress others, to say, look, I used beautiful words. I used, you know, this solemn vow, uh, and therefore my word counts. And by the way, this vow here that I didn't keep is because I didn't use those words. And Jesus is saying, think about the silliness of that. Now, in verse 34 here, Jesus is not forbidding taking oaths in certain cases. I mean, if that's the case, I violated that because when I was sworn in as a, an American citizen years ago, I took an oath. And some of you have taken oaths before when you served in public office or you, if you served as a juror, you took an oath. I did that a couple months ago and I was asked to do, or required to take an oath. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying don't ever take an oath. And the reason we know that is because he qualifies his statement on verse 34. He says, make no oath at all. And he gives the examples of the oaths that people were doing. Don't use those, he's saying. For, and the point is, for subjects of the kingdom of heaven, speaking the truth shouldn't be a problem anyway. So if asked to raise your right hand or place it on the Bible or to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, uh, your heart attitude should be like this if you're a believer in Christ. Of course I do. That's my standard anyway. Even without the formalities or with the threat of prosecution for perjury, I, I have no other option but to tell the truth because... I have been set free by the truth, according to John 8, 32. We follow the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. The reason we want nothing to do with deception is because we are no longer children of wrath, according to Ephesians 2, verse 3. We have no longer anything to do with the father of lies. So therefore, our attitude should be, of course I'll sign my contract. Of course I will honor. Even if I don't sign my contract, my plan is to honor this, and I'll do it at all costs anyway. Now, I'll sign a contract to make you feel better about my promise, of course, but know that in my heart, that's not even an issue. That's not even a question. And Jesus, therefore, reminds his audience here that they shouldn't swear frivolous by heaven, earth, or Jerusalem, or anything else for the purpose of getting out of complete honesty or for the purpose of betraying people by saying later on, see, <laughs> I didn't invoke the name of God on this one. You should have been more attentive. No, he's saying that is sinful, that is deception. You're acting like the father of lies, not like uh, uh, the, the father, our father who is in heaven. And in, Jesus, in, in verse 34, 5, rather, Jesus gives a simple rationale for that. It's very simple. He says this, whatever you say, however you word your vow, if you're doing it by Jerusalem, by the earth, or self, whatever, God is already a witness because he's everywhere. Whether you say the formalities or not, whether you raise your right hand or not, whether you place it in the Bible or on your chest, or even if you cross your finger, God is already watching. Why? Because he's in heaven, he's in earth, and Jerusalem is the capital of the new heaven and the new earth anyway. 
is what he's saying here. He is everywhere. And to make his point, Jesus even paraphrases Isaiah 66, verse 1, when God says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. So Jesus is making a very simple and clear point, saying, whether you invoke the witness of God or not, he is already in the transaction. Why? Because he's everywhere. So uh, you shouldn't have to swear to God. You shouldn't have to invoke his name. Just say what, you, what you're going to do and fulfill your commitment. Now, in verse 36, Jesus confronts another foolish oath, common at the time, but perhaps not so common today. And, and this is um, the oath that people would do. They would swear by themselves. Think about the arrogance and the self-centeredness of this. They would swear by themselves that they're telling the truth or they intend to keep their vows or that, that they will fulfill their end of the bargain. And they're offering as a guarantee to the other person, my own holiness. They would say, I'm going to fulfill my vow and I swear my own, by my own head as if you are the holiest of, the, of, the, of them all, as if you're not a sinner. And the point that Jesus is making is this very clearly. You cannot serve as your own witness against yourself because you will always be biased in your favor. Just like mom, you will always be biased in your favor. Now, swearing by yourself is the pinnacle of arrogance and self-centeredness because you can't even change the color of your hair, Jesus is saying here. You, you, you can't even control your aging process. You can't change the color of your hair uh, without the aid of cosmetics, of course. Or if you're like me, you just shave it off. You don't even know the color of your hair. The point is, you cannot even control your aging process. How can you invoke yourself to testify in your favor about your own honesty? And qu quite frankly, probably some people don't even know the color of their hair anymore, the natural color. So the only person who qualifies to do this, to swear on himself, to take an oath and guarantee or back up the guarantee of that oath by himself, there's only one person who can do that. And the author of the book of Hebrews tells us who. Let me read to you Hebrews 6, verses 13 through 14. Listen to this. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since who could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And there's another one uh, here in uh, Numbers 14, verse 28. The Lord says, as I live, as I live, I will surely do to you. So, and there are plenty of those in the Bible that God swears by himself. God is giving the guarantee of his promise. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't really mean the other uh, examples in the Bible when he says something. Now, because you may be asking, Pastor, does that mean that the promises of God that he uttered without an oath or a solemn oath are less binding? And the answer to this, before you even attempt uh, to consider that, the answer to this is obviously no. Because God cannot be less than perfectly truth. That is his nature. Remember, we talked about this a few, we a few weeks ago. He cannot lie. He cannot be any less truthful whether he makes a, a, pro a, binding a promise with a binding oath or not. In other words, the, the solemnity of the oath brings affirmation and comfort to the recipient of the promise. And that's the case with Abraham here. When Jesus promises him, he says, I promise you I'm going to do this. And I am the guarantee to my own promise. Now, God can do that because he, he is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He never lies. Now, people can and shouldn't do that. So, with or without an oath. What that means for us is this. With or without an oath, every promise that God makes to you, my friend, is backed up by the divine essence. That's the guarantee that we have. Every promise that God made to you is backed up by himself. The guarantee is his own essence, his own perfection. Uh, for example, Numbers 23, verse 19, we're, we're told that God is not a man that he should lie. And in Jeremiah 32, verse 27, we're told, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? So we should trust God completely when he makes promises to us. First of all, because he's never going to lie. He's not a man to go back on his promises. And second of all, uh, there's nothing difficult for God to do. There's, it's not a problem for God to pay what he committed to pay, if that's the case. It's not a problem for God to take you somewhere that he promised to take you. For example, heaven. It's not a problem for God to change your heart. Uh, if he promised to the... the, the that he would start a good work in you. You're, only, you're the only person who can resist that uh, process. And when you do, your life will be miserable. So, 
God is the only one who can do that. People shouldn't or cannot and shouldn't swear by themselves. That's the, a, a specific issue that Jesus is addressing here. So he exposes uh, the problem. He identifies the pattern and exposes the problem concerning deception and how subjects of the kingdom of heaven should um, handle that. And now he concludes with the principle in verse 37. And uh, the, the, he concludes this portion of the Sermon on the Mount by offering the solution to the Pharisaical problem, the substandard honesty. And according to him, here it is, according to him, subjects of the kingdom of heaven should always honor their word without the need to invoke God as a witness. Again, because he already knows your pure motives or the evil intent of your heart, if that's the case, before you even utter a word, before you even bring the, the pen and pencil to sign the contract, because God is present in heaven, earth, in Jerusalem, and everywhere else. By contrast, people shouldn't call upon their own natural honesty to testify on their behalf, because every one of us is a sinner by nature, evident by the fact that we can't even reverse our aging. And that's why Jesus uses this illustration of white hair and black hair, because that is a sign of aging. We cannot conclude, can't even control that process. We're sinners. And our white hair reminds us of that. For that reason, we shouldn't say any kind of frivolous oath that calls upon ourselves to testify. I speak the truth that I am my own guarantee. You shouldn't even have to say this. We shouldn't even have to invoke Jerusalem or invoke my dead mother or anybody else. And we shouldn't have to swear to God. In other words, God, Jesus says, you're, let your word be your bond. Tell the truth and mean it. When you make a commitment, honor. Honor every term of your commitment. And thus, Jesus dismantles the pharisaical system of convoluted oaths and vows and presents the principle of godly ethics, specifically in the area of honesty, integrity, and truthfulness in its purest form. In church, those of us who are subjects of the kingdom of heaven should live by that standard in everything we do. Lying shouldn't come up even as a, we are tempted to lie, but we, we shouldn't even consider it. Why? Because we are serving the one who confronts the human system of deception or, or, or situational ethics. So th there's no reason to lie. There's no reason to come up with white lies or half-truths. Just say what you mean, mean what you say. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to lie to people and say you love cats when you actually hate them. Or when you love dogs when you actually... Just say you prefer birds. You know, that, that's, that's a silly example, but that's... Uh, Lying isn't in our nature, in our sinful nature, in so much part of our system and in our culture, in our day-to-day -day lives, that we don't even notice it sometimes. In fact, if you remove lying from the political system, not only in America, but in every, uh, every system of government in the world, the system collapses pretty much. Why? Because it's a reminder that uh, the godly theocracy that Jesus promises to establish, meaning the millennium, he will rule in the truth. And every human uh, system, therefore, includes lying and is deceptive and it's uh, substandard. And that's why we're looking forward to the system of government, to a society that Christ is going to establish with him at the top, uh, being, you know, ruling with justice and truth. So for us, we shouldn't even have to swear to God we're telling the truth because God or Jesus calls us to uphold kingdom ethics. At the highest level, the standard which calls for honesty at all costs. So obviously, what we need to do when we learn this is you need to tell the truth. If you're holding on to a lie, you need to come and tell the truth. If you've been lying to your husband, to your wife, to your children, to anybody else, you need to come up with the, immediately, right now. We need, you need to come up with a plan to tell the truth and bear the consequences. God's going to be gracious to you. Why? Because you're a subject of the kingdom of heaven. You don't live according to the father of lies. And the other thing, too, is if, if you have a contract in your hands, if you have a commitment, honor that commitment at all costs. Don't, don't find ways to defraud the other person and try to get out of your commitment. Even if it's self-incriminating, even if it's embarrassing, even if it's unprofitable, inconvenient, and unpopular, we speak the truth. So when somebody asks you, what's your position on homosexuality, for example? You don't need to lie if you're a believer in Christ. You already know what your position is. You side with what Scripture says. It's unpopular. It may be inconvenient. It may even be dangerous. But you speak the truth at all costs. If anybody asks you, what's your position on divorce? There's no issue. 
Well, I side with what Scripture says. My position is aligned with what Scripture says. And Scripture says this about marriage and divorce. Somebody asks your, your position on uh, racism or violence. There's no question about that. You align your position with what Scripture says. You don't need to lie in order to uh, be popular or to come up, uh, you know, to, to, to propose an image that is not true. So that's how we're supposed to live. That's the principle that Jesus is uh, teaching here. Now, we keep our promises even if doing so costs time and money. If you're called upon to take an oath in court, do it. But uphold the truth at all time. If you decide to enter into a contract or a lease, not, but nobody's going to force you into one. If you decide to enter into a contract or a lease, honor the, honor the terms of your, signat- uh, of your contract, even if your signature is not necessary. For example, if you sign up a lease to pay a car, pay. Make the payments. Uh, do everything you can to honor your side of the contract. If you can't, just call them up and say, listen, this is what's going on. And make your intention known that you uh, want to honor the terms of that contract. Just don't get out of it and dishonor the name of God. Now, in this last verse here, there's another point we need to uh, address here. Is Jesus is not prohibiting you from changing your mind when he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He's not saying don't change your mind and for a simple reason. Let's, let's think logically here. A modification of plans is necessary from time to time. For example, Jesus calls people to change their minds about their sin. Okay, so if you're not a believer in Christ and you're hearing the gospel for the first time, you need to repent, which means you need to change your mind about who you are. You need to change your mind about who God is and what Jesus uh, has done for you. According to Scripture, you need to line up with what Scripture says and abandon uh, uh, what you have learned so far. That's what, that's what it means to be born again. So that calls for a change of mind. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 12 that we are to renew our minds. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, okay? Uh, another example here, a mundane example. Sometimes you are called upon to change your mind about what to wear. Didn't we talk about this last time? If the way you dress is causing other people to lust after you, you need to change your mind about that. The other thing too is if you, uh, sometimes you may need to change your mind about what you eat for health reasons. If you love bacon and your doctor says if you continue with that practice, you're going to die, then you need to change your mind about that. And so Jesus is not saying don't ever change your mind about anything. That's not the point. Uh, and likewise, you're not in violation of this principle if you decide to change careers. I already talked about this, but if you do it right, in, in fact, if God is calling you to the ministry, and that's happened to many people before, uh, they're in a career, okay? And God calls them to change careers, to become a minister of the gospel. Then they need to change their mind about that. They need to obviously make every effort to honor their commitments and provide the transition for that, and they need to change their minds about that. Now, I'll give you an example here. When, when um, it was clear that God was calling me to become the pastor at Grace Baptist Church, God was calling me to change plans. God was calling me to leave everything behind in Southern California and come here and be the shepherd of Grace Baptist Church. Well, I did everything I could to honor my commitments to the point where I talked to my boss at the time, our senior pastor, and he agreed with me. He said, this is obvious that God is calling you for that. I I don't want to stand in the way, although I would like you to stay here, but I'm not going to stand in the way of that. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's do it together. And I made a commitment to honor uh, what I had said and committed to a time of transition. So it wasn't until a month later that I came here because I wanted to make sure I honored my, the, the transition time that I gave everybody an opportunity to adjust. And um, I'm not saying this to say I'm the example of virtue. I'm just saying I'm, I'm just using an example that is close to home. And many of you have much better examples than this that we are to honor our commitments. Uh, and, and Jesus is not saying, don't change your mind ever about anything, that you are forever bound to do this for the rest of your life just because you said you would. No, we understand that sometimes there's a need to change and sometimes those needs are, are necessary. What he is saying, and oh, by the way, here's another example that I mentioned earlier. You need to, if sometimes you need to recant a story because you told a lie and now you're convicted by the truth, you need to recant that first story then honor God and tell the truth and say, I lied in the beginning, and here is the truth. 
That is honorable. That honors God. God will be gracious. God will honor you if that's the case. And if kids do it all the time when they're confronted with the lie and their mom and dad are talking to them and t- tell them, tell me the truth. Where did you get the candy? Tell me the truth. What did you do? And, and most, you know, in, in, in various cases, they will say, well, I did this and I told you a lie, but now uh, I, I, I want to tell the truth. And that's beautiful. That restores trust and restores the fellowship. So what Jesus is saying here is this. Don't deceive people by saying one thing and meaning something else. It's a simple statement here. Don't deceive others. Don't defraud others by saying this and meaning something else. And the reason we know that, uh, because he's talking about interpersonal relationships, because he's talking about murder at the heart. Then he moves on to lust and adultery at the heart. He's talking about defrauding people, use deception. And he's going to continue here talking about an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, the injury between people. So he's talking about interpersonal relationships. And he's saying the standard is much higher than you think. The standard is not the pharisaical system, but is a godly system of honesty. It's the highest standard, the highest standard of excellence when uh, talking about uh, honesty and being truthful. So don't deceive people by saying one thing and meaning something else. It's better not to say anything at all. Don't be quick to commit to things. And I, uh, you know, pastors uh, get sucked into this a lot, and that's truth in my world too. And I hate to give you another personal example, but I say yes to things before I even think about it. Because I'm pressured to give a response. People want me to do things for them. And I don't want to break their hearts. I don't want to say no to them. I don't want to be quick to say no. So I say yes to things. And some, I realized Im- almost immediately that was a bad idea. I shouldn't have said yes to this. I shouldn't have committed to this. Uh, and and all, almost all the time, I can't get out of it. I need to honor what I've committed to. But then I, I, I say I need to commit no longer. And I have said this before many times. Uh, and say, so well, I'm going to commit until this point, but after this, I need to tell you, I, I, I didn't think this through. I didn't realize this was going to take that much time or energy on my part, but I, I need to say I can no longer commit from this point on. I hope you're okay with that. I honored my commitment until this point, but from now on, please find somebody else or, or please adjust your plans. And I'm not dishonoring the, the principle here from Jesus if I'm doing it the right way instead of just not showing up. That would be dishonoring to God. Because I would be defrauding people. I would give the impression that I said something and meant something else. So, the point here is this, a summary in this verse here. You don't have to make promises. But when you do, or when you are required to make them, for example, for a job or some sign of contract, uh, just keep your word. You don't need to to, to swear to God. You don't need to invoke, invoke God's name. Because He's already in the transaction. If you need to sign a paper, do it. And, and, and in your heart, the attitude should be, of course, I, I don't mind signing my name in a dotted line here because that is my intent anyway. Make sure you read the, the, the small print. Make sure you, you know what you're committing to. So in summary, this is how subjects of the kingdom of heaven should handle deception. And Jesus spoke about the pattern, the problem, and the principle. Very simple. And I want to conclude with this. Since um, he's talking about saying yes and no to some things, I want to stay within the context and talk about a few things we should say yes to and some things we should say no to. Again, based on the context and the immediate context of the Sermon on the Mount here. Here's the first one. You don't have to get married. That's a decision you make. But if you do, you need to honor your marriage vows at all costs. And you need to honor the biblical vision of marriage don't 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 do marriage like the world does in the world the, the, the way the world does marriage is this it's all about me all, all about me being happy if you don't make me happy then there's a problem no no, no that's how the world does and christ says i have a better standard okay so you don't have to get married but if you do you honor your marriage vows and not only that if you're a husband my uh, friend you love your wife like christ loved the church unconditionally sacrificially and if you are a wife, you submit to your husband as unto the Lord because that's what the Bible says. And you do it with a glad heart because that's God's standard. And when you honor that standard, God will honor you even though from time to time it may be hurtful. And from time to time there's no perfect harmony in that because you're talking about two sinful people living in the same house and having different opinions about uh, how to do the paper towel. How to, uh, how to roll the, the, the toilet paper, how to squeeze the tube of toothpaste. The, the people actually fight about these things. 
So you don't have to get married, but if you do, you honor your marriage vows at all costs. Divorce shouldn't even be in your heart. And murder shouldn't either, okay? Now here's what you should say no to according to the immediate context here and uphold the standard of virtue that Jesus expects from us. Uh, and never practice spiritual hypocrisy. You should vow in your heart to never practice pharisaical religion, pharisaical uh, hypocritical uh, religion. You should vow that in your heart. No need to sign a paper. You don't need to, to say all the formalities. Simply decide in your heart and ask God to equip you to focus on the heart rather than the outside, um, outside uh, compliance. You don't need to take a solemn oath. Just determine to not commit murder in the heart, for example, by forgiving your offender, by extending forgiveness to the person who hurt you, and not hating him or her, because that would be the same as murder in the heart. So you commit to saying no to these things. You also commit to saying no to lust. We can use the word, uh, the, the language that we used last week, the Job used, make a covenant with your eyes. Again, you don't need to make a solemn oath. You don't need to take a solemn, uh, sign a contract. Just make a covenant with your eyes that you will continuously pray for purity. And you will honor this system, uh, Jesus' system, and determine to live a life of purity. Now, Jesus addresses many more issues of the heart in the remainder of chapter 5, and then a few more in chapter 6. We're going to cover, for example, next week, uh, talk about the relevance of the Word of God. Brian reminded us about this earlier, and again, we, we, we couldn't plan this better. Next week, we're going to talk about how to respond to insults. An injury, because that's next in the text here. I may take a week or may, may take two uh, to cover that, because there's so much to cover, so much to talk about. But that's the relevance of the Word of God. So for now, I want to encourage all of us to uphold um, the standard that Jesus expects from us concerning deception, and that is, it doesn't even, it shouldn't even cross our minds. Okay, if you're a believer in Christ, you have a commitment to telling the truth. And meaning what you vowed to commit. It doesn't mean you don't, you can't change careers, you can't change ministry, volunteer uh, positions. Here, that's not what it means. But if you do need to change it, do it right. Honor your commitments and and do it right, uh, because God is going to be glorified, and uh, it's going to speak volumes of the integrity of your heart, and that's going to glorify Jesus Christ. We're being the light of the world, and you've heard me say this more than ever in the last few months. We have in our hands a great opportunity to be the light of Christ in, in a dark world more than ever before. More in my lifetime, I've never seen such, a, such great opportunities for us to shine brighter for the glory of God so that people will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And again, as long as that, those good works are proceeding from a transformed heart. And we're not focused on outside compliance only, but we're focused on heart transformation. Because when you aim at heart transformation, friends, act, uh, attitudes and words and all of these things will, will flow naturally. Because the Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So uh, it's our commitment to honor God and Christ in everything we, we do. And here's another um, thing you should say yes to. And we'll all finish with this. If you're not a follower of Christ... You need to come to Jesus Christ right now because He's calling you. He's summoning you to come to Him and say, Repent and come to Him and be saved. Now, if you don't do it, of course, I still want to be your friend. But if you do it, I want to hear about it. And we want to walk together because, again, the Bible says He starts a good work in you and you will um, complete it until the day of Christ. But that's God's standard. It's very different uh, from the world. Deception is in our uh, subconscious minds. And sometimes we do it without even noticing it. But if the Lord is bringing to mind and bringing to your heart something that uh, you're not speaking the truth about, something you need to repent and come forth and speak the truth to, to your spouse, to whoever, you do it today. Otherwise, um, you're going to continue to live a life of hypocrisy. And that, that's not going to honor God. So um, only God knows your heart. So however embarrassing that might be, you speak the truth. And if you are in the middle of a commitment and you are being tempted to not fulfill that commitment, ask God to give you the heart to, uh, to equip you to commit to that, to, to what you have committed. And then at the end of that, if you need to say, listen, I need to stop this, as long as it's not your marriage, you, you, you vow to make uh, that commitment until one of you dies, then you honor that commitment at all costs. And God's going to honor that. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you again for the opportunity to open the Word of God and see what you have to say, the Lord, about uh, the issue of deception, something that is so ingrained in our sinful nature, Lord. We lie sometimes not even knowing that we lie, Lord. We are untruthful sometimes and subconsciously, Father, because it's, it's part of our culture, it's part of our society, Lord, it's part of our flesh. Lord, but uh, you called us to a high standard of living. You call us to uh, live a life that honors God. And as subjects of the kingdom of heaven, we should honor the king. And we honor the king by speaking the truth because the king is the way, the, the truth, and the life. And we have been set free by the truth, Lord. So, Father, help us understand that and make adjustments in our lives. Whatever is necessary, Lord. However, oh, however, whatever is going to cost and however unpopular it might be, Father. Uh, but those of us here at Grace Baptist Church, Lord, we desire to speak the truth. We desire to honor you, Lord, and, and so that we can avoid hypocritical religion, something you condemn, that Jesus condemns so much here, Lord. We don't want to be, be like those guys that Jesus is condemning, Lord, but we are sinners, and we want to be pray like this. Father, have mercy on us, the sinners, Lord, and, and when you do, Father, we pray that you will um, equip us to live a life that honors you. In such, in, in, in such unprecedented days, Lord, we have great opportunities to do that, to shine the light of Christ, to hold the baton, and to uphold the truth of the Word of God, Lord. I pray that we will do this boldly here at Grace Baptist Church. We consider a great honor and privilege to do that, Lord. And in the process, we pray, Father, that you will continue to protect us, from both the disease that's out there, Lord, and from discouragement, Lord, and from um, depression or being overwhelmed with everything that's going on, Lord, uh, around us. Give us a, a renewed sense of your presence, Lord. Rekindle our love for you and our a sense of passion for you, Lord, because we need it, and we need it every day, Lord. And we thank you for that, Father. And uh, again, we want to say that our joy... Uh, surpasses all understanding. Our peace surpasses all understanding. That doesn't mean from time to time we question and we wonder what's going on, Lord. But the truth is we, we have the joy of the Lord and we want to live uh, by that joy because, Lord, we want to honor you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.